morning, everybody. How are you doing this morning? You all saw the film. What did you think of Doctor Strange by round of applause? Great. We're going to have a great press conference this morning with the filmmakers and the actors and actresses of Doctor Strange. Let's start with the producer of Doctor Strange and the president of I Marvel did. Studios, I did. It was good. Kevin Feige. Hello. Good morning. Matt Mickelson. <laughs> Rachel McAdams. <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch. Strange made its first appearance in Strange Tales, July 1963, issue 110. So for a character that has been part of the Marvel Universe for so long, why Kevin and Scott was now the right time to bring him into the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Well, it's something we've been talking about for many, 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 many years. Uh, and sometimes things just work out. You know, timing often, uh, particularly in the Cinematic Universe, works out well for us. And it, it'll be our 14th film within the MCU, and we always say we have to push the boundaries, we have to keep surprising people, we have to keep making them unique and different, um, and certainly this movie and this character fits all of that. And also tapping into other dimensions and tapping into sort of that supernatural realm of the Marvel comic universe is going to come in handy you know, as we move forward throughout the cinematic universe, so the timing was perfect. I mean, I, you know, uh, Kevin's the one who green lights the movie, so <laughs> he's the official answer. I mean, I think that uh, the comics, as a fan of the comics, growing up with the comics, Doctor Strange was, uh, you know, product of the 60s and was a big breath of fresh air into, into the world of comics at that time. And uh, as a fan watching movies, I, I felt ready for some new, daring, weird left turns, you know, in the world of comic books and the MCU. I think Guardians of the Galaxy was that. Uh, and, you know, I was so pleasantly surprised when I saw how bold that movie was. So when I came in to meet on Doctor Strange, you know, my approach was, let's make this as weird in the MCU as the comic was in the comic book world in the 60s. And that's, that's what we tried to do. Well, one of the things that you did push to make this movie was the start time. You know, when you see a film, when you see an actor or an actress in a role, cannot imagine anyone else playing this character, you know you got the right person. And I feel like that is definitely the case with Benedict Cumberbatch as Stephen Strange and Doctor Strange. But what, Thank you. what sort of changes did you make to make sure that you can make this movie with Benedict? Well, we, um, moved, we moved the release yeah, schedule. We pushed the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, what Sorry. happened was be <laughs> Kevin and I talked about, about, about you know who, who we wanted in the role, and we landed on Benedict pretty quickly, and uh, and just felt like he was he was right. I flew to London, um, met with him, explained the movie. Uh, I think I had some of my concept art at that point, and and Benedict really wanted to do it, but he was doing Hamlet um, in on, in, in theater uh, in London, so we were a summer release movie. So it wasn't going to work, you know? And I came back and I met with a bunch of other actors, good actors, but I just felt like it had to be Benedict. And Kevin, to his credit, agreed. And so we pushed the, the schedule for him. You know, for, for I'm Benedict. Very glad they did. Yes, please. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, it's incredibly flattering. It's a, it's a weight of responsibility as well, obviously. But um, it's a great motivator to try and do a good job and fulfill, you know, the, the promise they've shown in you. So. Uh, that they've given to you. I always get that phrase wrong, but you know what I mean. It's, um, it's a good thing. It's a very good place to start from. Well, you know, for, for everyone on stage here, to be part of this Marvel Cinematic Universe, it, it really is like a family, and I feel like we all saw that. For everyone who was at Comic-Con in July, that class photo at the end of the panel was really awesome. Yeah. So, so for everyone who's new to the MCU here, like, what was it, what's it really like to be part of this? Rachel, let's start with you. Uh, 
Well, I mean, I, I was just I was just thrilled because um, because of this incredible <coughs> track record, because of um, that you know so much care and attention and consideration is going to go into the film before you've even begun. So, um, and that you're gonna get to work with the best of the people, the best of the best in the world, uh, what they do. Um, so it's just this like treasure trove of, of talent and um, you know, so I, I just couldn't wait to dive into that. Well, how about, how about Benedict and Tilda? This has gotta be new for you too. What do you think? I keep saying that it's a bit like being invited to join the circus. <laughs> you know, you get invited to be the bearded lady or the painted gentleman or something, and, and you may have a chance in the future to play with a clown or learn a bit of trapeze or work with the ponies with the plumes. It's really, the thing, the reason that feels like a, a correct way to describe it is that everybody's so psyched. I mean, even the Sorcerer Supreme, Kevin Feige, is just the super fan of all super fans. And that's, he's the, the master of the big top. And it just feels such a lucky break for everybody who's working in that circus top, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be a part of this. I mean, growing up as a kid, I was always collecting Marvel comics and especially Spider-Man comics. And, uh, it's just lovely to see my investment as a child is uh, the fruition in my adult life and uh, education. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, just a, a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful time. Yeah. You know, Matt. Yeah. In the last ten years, Matt Nicholson, <coughs> see James Bond, Star Wars, Rogue One, Doctor Strange, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm. Like, right. You yeah. Put yourself in cover. Yeah, it's, I mean, can only join these guys. It's, it's, I mean, for someone who grew up with, with, the, uh, with the comic books, basically half of my life I was reading comic books and the other half I was watching Bruce Lee. So, uh, so when, uh, when Scott was pitching the story for me, I think 10 minutes within the pitch, he said, and there's a lot of kung fu and flying stuff. I said, whoa, hold on, rewind. <laughs> What bit? The Kung Fu bit. I'm on. Let's go. <laughs> uh, it's like, it's, it was just, it's a childhood dream coming true. It's, it's just amazing that you, at the age of 108, uh, get the chance to fly around in orange He doesn't clothes. move like a 108 year old, I can tell you that. Yeah. In the evening I do. <laughs> so in no, it was a dream coming true. I mean, it's something that as a kid you were looking at, it's like, obviously you would never <laughs> dream about being up there, but you, you identified with the characters, right? And, and um, so, yeah, it's a big honor to be here. Well, you know, as now that we're more than eight years into the MCU, it started with Iron Man in 2008. It's hard to believe it's been eight years. So, for Kevin and for Scott, what are the challenges to, to make these films fresh so they don't fall Check. into a formula, they don't feel conventional, even by superhero standards? That could happen, but I feel like you really did succeed in making this fresh and different while still fun and fitting in with the MCU. But what were the challenges with that, Scott? I mean, the, you know, the challenge was to try to make a movie that um, is as visually progressive by movie standards as, as the, the Ditko art was in the 60s. You know, those, it, our primary source of inspiration was the early Stanley Steve Ditko comics, and that artwork is still progressive. You know, you look at a lot of the panels in the comics, and, and that was our primary source of inspiration and visual effects have just caught up to where we can do some of the things that we did in this movie. And I, and I think that the, the trick of it was to not hold back and to push ourselves as far as possible to do original things with the set pieces. I remember in some of my early meetings saying that I felt like, my, that my goal was for every set piece in the movie to be the weirdest set piece in any other movie, you know? But e each one of them would, would be uniquely odd and unusual and, re and refreshing. And uh, that comes out of uh, movie fandom more than anything else, because that's what I want to see. I, 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 wanted, I, I want to see event movies that use visual effects, you, and you use visual effects sequences for more than just mass destruction but get more creative with them and, and find new ways to do them and give the, me as an audience member some kind of visceral experience that's unique. Because the movies that do that are memorable and change, you know, and, and change the way you feel about cinema in general. And, and I, you know, I don't know if we, if, if we achieved that, but, but it was certainly the goal to, to push ourselves into 
something new and something fresh so that the audience would be genuinely surprised in, in moments and, uh, and get their money's worth, you know? Yeah, I mean, like the special effects were definitely groundbreaking. And like, I mean, at the screening I went to on Tuesday night, everyone was like, wow. But the art from Steve Ditko's panels in the early comics still had like the circles around Doctor Strange's hands and all that. So I think it really had a good blend. Um, but, you know, for Benedict, when you got all decked out with the cloak and, and, and just really saw yourself, looked in the mirror for the first time and saw yourself as yeah. Doctor Strange, were you like, wow, this is I, cool? Yeah, I, I was sort of giddy like a child at Halloween. I just, I, it's that, it was the first moment, really, properly. And Alex spotted it, our brilliant designer, who's done a few of these films, and she went, oh, you're having the superhero moment, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, yeah, I think I am. It really was the penny drop moment for me. Uh, you know, this, this film had lots of alluring um, qualities, um, lots of things that made me really want to go to it, and this character in particular, and in particular what Scott and, and Kevin were pitching to me is his trajectory, his origin story, and where he was going to lie within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But the journey he goes on was sort of supremely important to me. And the qualities of drama, but also great humour amongst that profundity yeah. and that oddness and unique weirdness and newness that we were going to bring visually. So... Um, I kind of put the hero thing on the back burner. So when I first had that moment, it really was quite giddy. I just did end up just giggling. Um, and then the second time it really hit home was, was, was near the end of the, the, the main body of the shoot. And when we were in New York, we were in, on Fifth Avenue. And there were as many paparazzi as there were crew. It was getting a little bit surreal. And, but we were on Fifth Avenue and running down it, and sort of jumping, well, skipping really, but jumping to fly. And there was the Empire State Building in the same uh, eye line. And it was, it was just a moment of magic to think that the, you know, the men and women that first crafted these comics on the, on the floors of some of, those, of the, that building and other buildings in that town. Didn't you go there, into Forbidden Planet or you went into a comic book I went into a comic store book there. store, which was the last day shooting in New York. And, and yeah, Scott was just like, Dude, wow. look, look, it's I have, I, I have the video on my phone. I've never sent it to anybody but Benedict. It was, our, it was, it was a spontaneous thing. He said, there's a comic book store right there. And he was in full... Someone you know, me, like, Dr. Strange, I said, we have to go in. And he goes, he goes, we should, shouldn't we? I go, I'll film it, it'll just be us. And we were getting ready to shoot. And he said, I said, okay. And I put the camera on him, and then he just said, he said, okay, he introduced himself. He said, okay, I'm about to go into this comic book store, and I followed him in. And, uh, in and character. The, 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 the um, people who were there couldn't believe that it was Dr. Strange. He just walked did you in buy a Dr. And Strange? And he bought a couple of Dr. Strange comics. No, I didn't have any money, so I didn't buy any... Uh, <laughs> Comics, but I, I offered my services. I said, look, look, if the film doesn't work out, I'll come and stack the shelves for you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Might be a bit heartbreaking, like oh, Doctor Strange issue number five. Oh, God, yeah. yeah, I remember um, the comic book store owner said that'd be fine, but you had to ha keep your American accent. That's right. So you're going to yeah. work there, <laughs> which would have probably been amused him as much as yeah. anything else. But yeah, uh, no, it was um, it was a magic, magic moment. No pun intended. It was it was very special and utterly like a lot of things in this film. Very uh, sort of. Not search for, they just, they came about for the right reasons. It really was the last place we were starting, the last shot of running away from Mads Chilson and I, and there was that comic book store, it was incredible. Okay, I just want to speak for everyone in this room. Will you please post that? <laughs> the CCT footage has already been posted, I'm sure of that. Yeah, yeah but I'm talking made. about the actual spontaneous. Your one, my, yeah. my, Can I post it? I'm asking, no. I, no, that's for a no. Everybody. That's a no. That's What's Benedict for no. Oh, no, no, was it? No, I thought it was Kevin for no. I was, I was, I was just looking at you. Okay. <laughs> I should, yes. But saying no. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll post it for that. <laughs> Let's it's open it up hard. to the audience here. Who wants to start with the first question? Debbie, you go first. <laughs> you. Debbie. Do we have mics? Do we have mics? We do have mics. Yes, we do. I had to ask that for Michael. So... Congratulations, all of you. This is a real, it is a visual stunner. It is a story stunner. One of the best origin stories that I have seen in the M in MCU. So kudos to you, Scott, to Cargill, and to you, Kevin, for putting all that together. Something I, that I found very striking, very elegant uh, about the film is the hand choreography in conjunction with the visual effects. For the two Benedicts, Tilda and Mads, can you talk about that hand choreography and the elegance and the precision of it that was required in order to meld with the VFX. Well, that hand choreography is a, is a thing called tutting. We had a, a proper master working with us for weeks, I would say. I mean, just as much as learning martial arts, we were learning how to tut with Jay Funk, 
who is somewhere here possibly, but if he's not, you should go on YouTube and look for Jay Funk, because he really knows how to do it. And he's got yeah. properly magic fingers, like, you know, not like our fingers, like real non-CGI fingers. And he taught us a series of extraordinary, very precise movements, which have to be super precise, because if you're going to go like that, you have to be at a certain point where the line is going to be drawn between your fingers. And you can't, of course, be in front of your face, which was always my issue. I was always going in front of the, my face with it. And then you have to be exactly the right width so that you're in the frame. And it was super precise and uh, kind of hairy, but really good fun. And can we all do it now? Possibly not. Possibly I'm, not. I'm, 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 I'm the, the, the lower not. league of uh, hand. You're uh, not, you're <laughs> not, <laughs> he didn't do very much. Yeah, yeah, he didn't have to do much, no. Not yet, maybe. Yeah, it was yeah, really you, you I need to practice in front of a mirror first. Yes, we need to practice maybe. in front of a mirror and, and, and Jay Funk, but yeah, it was a. Yeah. It was a you're right about, it was a great she's right about blocking learning. her face, though. Here's half of my direction to Tilda was her doing things like this and saying, great, Tilda, just lower, lower, <laughs> so I can see your face, lower, okay. But she was brilliant. I mean, she's being very humble about it. She was incredibly good at it, and also because she was instructing Strange at the same time. I mean, there was, there was some quite heavy dialogue going on while she was, you know, drawing a mandala and punching energy and doing very delicate stuff. You did, you did runes with brushes and all sorts of magic stuff. But it's such fun because you have these extraordinary visual effects directors saying, by the way, this is going to look like this. And they'll show you one shot and you'll go, it's going to look like that. And they say, yeah, trust us, it will. And then you kind of forget that. And then if you're lucky enough as I have to have seen the film and seen what they did with it, it's beyond anything they warned us it was going to be. And uh, that's kind of why we look fairly relaxed about it, because we had no idea. I think if we'd known it was going to be so awesome, we would have been like this. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? Right over here, front. Um, Mads, you've played in the uh, Bond film, you played Hannibal, so you've done these really kind of iconic villainous characters <laughs> who were really relished their villainy, so to speak. But here you play a character who... Uh, from his perspective, he's the hero. He's going to save the world. And even when he kills people, and that's kind of a sign of his villainy, it's not really that different from some of the good guys who are saying, yes, we have to kill, but it's to save the world for a greater good. Can you talk a little bit about approaching a villainous role that, I mean, when you did it, did you kind of come into it just thinking, I'm going to play this character as the hero, as far as he, he thinks it's a story about him, like trying to save the world, the rest of them are the villains. Well, I, I always play all, all characters as a hero. Uh, I, I mean, I think we have to, uh, to look at it that way. I, the key to any good <clears throat> villain, <clears throat> which I think was uh, very clear from the beginning in this script, is that they have a point. Uh, it's not completely crazy what they're saying. It's, it, there is a point. Even in Doctor Strange's eyes, he does believe I have a point. Even though it's for a fraction, it's there. And, and I think that, that's the key for a good villain. You have to have uh, something the, the audience identify with. So he doesn't just go ballisting and say, I'm going to take over the world, and because I can. <laughs> it's fun. You know, no, it's the reason, <laughs> you know. Eternal life. Doesn't it make sense? You know, uh, and what's he thinking about up there? Honestly, just placing us here for a fraction of time? Doesn't make sense. So I'm onto something, and I think all good villains should, should be there. And then obviously it's in the script, and Scott was on that page. And uh, so we tried to make him a man who believes in what he's talking about, a little like, <laughs> you know, a demagogue, Jamestown, uh, Jonestown, whatever he's called, right? Some, somebody who believes utterly in every word he says. Actually, I meant to ask you, Rachel, yesterday, that when you sign on to play Chris, Christine Palmer, did you like do like a binge reading of comics to like get back get up to speed with all this? I I did read. Um, Scott sent a few my way that I looked at, and I looked at. Um, well, is she sort of an amalgamation of a bunch of different characters? So there wasn't one particular place to go to, which I was kind of excited about because she could be kind of a new invention in a way. Sure. Um, but um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I looked at a lot of Nightcrawler because she was in a lot of those and. Yeah, and, and I've been getting up to speed with, con I was reading Judy Bloom when I was 
Oh, sure. Yeah. A teenager. So, um, As you should. So yeah. I've, been, <laughs> I've been kind of getting up to speed in, uh, on, um, on the comic universe, but um, I love graphic novels. I just devour those now. So yeah. I love the medium, and I think it translates to film. You know, just, it's just such a perfect matchup. So, um, yeah, I'm still learning, though. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's, it's always scrapped. a learn. Yeah. <laughs> Who's next? Who has a question? Yes. Like the, yeah, uh, right over here on the aisle. Benedict, uh, the key to the Doctor Strange is his, you know, at the beginning, is his arrogance, his confidence, smartest guy in the room, and, and the fall and the humbling he, he goes through. Is that like playing Holmes, or is that completely different? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say that fall's still going on, to be honest, uh, in, in, that, in that particular franchise. But um, so, no, I'd say it's, it's slightly different. I mean, the, the, there's, in the Venn diagram of Similarities, there is the crossover of clever and arrogant, I suppose, and workaholic. But, you know, Strange is a materialist. He's egocentric, yes, but he's got charm and he's witty. He, he's liked by his colleagues. He's had relationships with them. He's not, um, yeah, he's not the sort of cut-off outsider, sociopathic, asexual, obsessive that Sherlock is. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, there's, a, there's a world of difference. And he doesn't, you know, it, yeah. He lives in New York and eats bagels every now and again, so that's, that's also different. He's, you know, he's a man of the world, as opposed to Sherlock, who isn't. Um, I won't say on that. <laughs> Sorry. Who's next? Uh, yes. Hi, Kit. Right over here in the middle, if you can. Uh... Um, Rachel, I know, you know everyone got to kind of do some fun stuff. Did you kind of want to say, hey, let me just do it for a second. Let me just do the whole hand <laughs> thing. How is it? Uh, uh, I mean, sure. Now, hearing Tilda talking about it now, I'm like, yeah, that's a, I could dig that. Um, but I, my mom's a nurse, and I did not inherit that gene. Um, it's just why I'm up here right now. But, um, uh, but I was always fascinated by what she did because it was so far from anything I really understood. So to get to delve into the, the medical side of things and shadow these incredible, I met this incredible female neurosurgeon in Toronto um, and um, we had a great neurosurgeon on set and I got to, um, I was given the offer to go in an evac helicopter and do a weekend. Um, which I'm so sad I had to turn down because I'm a terrible flyer and I am really queasy about blood. So I thought I would be more <laughs> of a hindrance to that um, operation than a help. So um, I declined that. But everything else was super fascinating. And um, in a pinch, I could probably suture someone up now. So, uh, and, I, and it was so nice to wear scrubs all the time. <laughs> uh, when he was putting that cloak on and sweating buckets, uh, I was... Uh, you were doing your nails. <laughs> I was did, doing did you, yeah, Still waiting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, I learned a lot on this in a different way. Who's next? Yes, you. Yeah, you. Raising your hand. Um, my question is for Mr. Benedict Cumberbatch. And in the movie, Doctor Strange says to the Ancient One, how do I get from here to there? So who is that one person for you that you're always striving to get to their level of expertise? Well, I wish there was one that would simplify my answer. But the truth is, I get to work with a whole cast of them almost every job. But this job in particular was extraordinary. I mean, everyone on it was helping me raise my game and in every level. Um, I mean, you know, Rachel's just talked about Scrubland. I mean, that was, that was a very detailed world, and to watch her craft, to watch her scalpel-like precision, pun intended, with just delineating exactly what was going on, where Christine was in that moment, and, and it just it, it helped map out an entire world that I knew my character was shifting away from, but had to be completely invested with, uh, hopefully, like the audience is at the beginning, and through the duration of the film, when he crashes back into it. Um, from Tilda treading this incredible line between being uh, ancient and wise and yet ever youthful as she is and just incredibly now and present and not something old and fussy, fusty, um, and just doing it with grace and charm and, and, and good nature that all of the cast of this had. Um, 
Uh, Chiwetel, who I've worked with before, um, again, to watch him construct Mordo and see the, compl the complexity of his journey as well come to fruition. I mean, all of it. And Mads, this man over here who complains about being 100 but moves like a 20-year-old with dreams of moving sometimes. I mean, he just <laughs> is the most absurd athlete, but also the most understated and supreme gentleman who uh, is always trying to make sure that you're all right and that your craft is all right and that you're not getting hit in the face or hurt, you know. And that's, that's, that's not always the case in fight scenes. Um, uh, to Benny, who I've known for a while, um, we're old muckers, but to, to get to play with him and see, and I, you know, I adore Wong, I think the world's gonna absolutely love that character, and uh, it, was, it was a master stroke on his part. Um, and yeah, they're the people who I get to work with every day on a job like this, and then headed by a director and a mastermind who both know their craft inside out and you feel safe in their hands of. Uh, parents, I mean, this could go on for a long time. This could be the moment. Uh, I haven't touched on school days yet. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky. I've worked with some truly inspiring people, and a lot of them on this huge sofa with me. Who's next? Uh, yes, you're in the end. In the glasses. You. Yes. Hang on, wait for the microphone. <laughs> uh, for Kevin and Scott. You guys touched a little bit on kind of the trippier sequences in the movie. I'm just very curious if you could talk a little bit more about how those were developed and designed and if there was ever a point where you thought, oh, this might be a little bit too far, maybe we should back off a little bit on that. Uh, I think there were a lot of those points, uh, but we just kept pushing forward and our amazing effects team led by Steph Soretti did a great job. And Scott was, uh, you know, in there right to the, to the bitter end until about 12.30 a.m. the day before we got on the plane to Hong Kong That's for the true. first... Uh, for the first chunk it. Wow. Yeah, it, we, uh, uh, it was, you know, we, because, because we moved the schedule for Benedict, we had a shorter post-production period, Sorry. really, than, than we wanted. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. But, 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 but a uh, longer to Kevin and, and Louis to yeah. you know, right. uh, credit, we hired more vendors than y it, to start all at once than you normally would have. So we had a lot of the stuff coming in all at the same time. Um, but that was uh, one of the most creatively rewarding parts of the whole process was to, to try to think about not just, you know, weird, bizarre images, but to try to think about what, what can't be done. You know, the final sequence of the movie uh, was the result of, of, of me just thinking, well, what can't you do? You know, and this idea of, uh, of a fight scene going forward while a city's undestroyed backwards, well, you can't, you can't, that's impossible. Okay, great, let's do it. You know, and so we designed the scene and, and storyboard, you know, I'd storyboard out things and then work with the previs team and get, get, get it all down and how, we, how it looked, and then we figured out how to, how to make it. And so it was about trying to establish, and the same thing like with what we call the magical mystery tour, the whole mind trip scene. You know, it was about drawing out every single shot and, and some of it being impossible to do and then and and the, the result was that the visual effects vendors had to sometimes help us figure out well how do we do this because it, it, it is unprecedented it hasn't been done before and uh, and some of those ideas didn't work the, and you know sometimes we would try things and it just it was we were, it, we were overshooting but me personally I felt like every day I got up for work and I thought somebody's gonna come knock on my door and say you got to back off this is just getting too weird you know, and it never happened. I mean, yeah, Marvel was really completely behind the idea of uh, trying to push the boundaries of, of what a set piece in a tentpole movie can be. And uh, that was always the goal. I'm with you on the Beatles reference, Magical Mystery Tour. Very good. <laughs> yeah, All right, who else is Scott Menzel, right there. First off, I have to say that out of every Marvel movie so far, this is the best cast, hands down. You guys all killed it. So you should know that. And Scott, yeah. amazing direction. Yay. Um, and, and this question is directed for Benedict. Um, in the comic book, there's a uh, arc about the Illuminati. Will that be making a presence in any of the future films in the MCU? Kevin Feige. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, he is the real source of Supreme, so um, that, I really would pass that question over to him. It's not mine to answer. Well, what's uh, fun about the Illuminati, right, are certain characters interacting with other certain characters. Um, so I don't know about that particular storyline, but certainly some of those characters you will see together on, on screen 
in uh, the next Avengers film. Is what I was going to say. Da, da, da. Go <laughs> <laughs> okay, got time for a couple more. Uh, yeah, right here in the front. Yes. In the in the sixties, uh, these ideas of alternative universe and open your mind was very strong, and groups like the Beatles were there. So I'd like to ask you, Benedict and Tilda and Rachel, uh, the, the actors who wants to answer this, but about which re relation you see in this world to the things that happened in the 60s. You, you, you prove it in the movie, but about this thing about open your mind and think about open your imagination and mind. Well, I wouldn't say that the 60s had it all. I would say, if anything, maybe more than ever, we need to concentrate on opening our minds, <coughs> and in particular to knowing that our minds are ours to have some kind of perspective on. There's something really radical that's said in this film, which is that ego and fear are things to be lived beyond. And let's face it, uh, this is a hot topic. We really, really need people to remind us right now that ego and fear are not necessarily the only option we can live through. So. I would say, yeah, the 60s comes around again, but, but more and, uh, and stronger. And this is such a modern film for that reason. And I would say that's the reason why it's perfect that it's made now, um, because it's, the time is really right for it. Last question. Oh, go ahead. No, I, no. I, think, I think I would, I would completely utterly, um, you know, condone what you said. I, I, you know, it's about mindfulness in a sense. I think that's, the, that's the, the common derivative which has carried through. Culturally, we're still referencing that era. We, we always will. It was a very strong moment in, uh, in, in, in all culture, in all pop and music. But um, I think you have to reinvent the wheel slightly. You can't just replicate it. This is a, this is a film for now. Um, but I think, like Tilda was saying, the strongest message is the idea that you, with your mind, have the power to change your reality. And that's, that's, a, that's a great, wonderful, freeing, egoless message. And also, you do that with the idea of doing it for the good of others, and you're on to um, a very, very good thing, as Doctor Strange gets to by the end of the film. Last question is this. At the end of the film, it says, Doctor Strange will return. <coughs> Looks like James Bond, right? So where? Will Doctor Strange go with the Doctor Strange series, but also within the MCU, other films, Avengers, and so on? Well, I mean, uh, just taking one step at a time, Benedict puts on <laughs> yeah. the cloak again early next year uh, in Avengers Infinity War. Scott? <clears throat> uh, that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> Benedict, how, how long do you see yourself wanting to play Stephen Strange. Oh, well, you know, let's, let's get this film out first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love these, yeah. I'm, it, one, of the, one of the things of mindfulness is being present now, you know, and I, I just want to enjoy today. I really, really do. That we're bringing this film to, to the world properly for the first time. This is the world premiere in, in its rightful hometown, and um, I'm so excited about it. I haven't seen the film yet. Um, and if I don't have too many of these or get a proper nap, um, <laughs> I, will, I will be just glued to my seat. I know I'm going to be, it's going to, it's, I can't wait. I can't wait You're to share this it. moment. You're going to love it. I'm going to love all it. Gonna oh, I thought you said, is that a latte? It is a latte, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, Benedict, Tilda, Benedict, Rachel, Mads, Kevin, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Scott. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, see you Thank then. you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thanks, Bye. Scott. I'll see you tonight. I'll see you tonight. I'll see you tonight. I thought it said the silliest word we've done in the end of the film. I think that's Benedict's. Benedict's. Thanks, my friend. I appreciate it. Benedict.